before we officially start and with our friends who are joining us online, we have a question for our audience. We're grateful to all of you for remaining masked as we seek to contain and limit the spread of the pandemic. We wanna know people's comfort level if our guest speakers tonight were to remove their masks while speaking. Thumbs up if you feel comfortable. If you don't, thumbs down. You can do it at the same time people doing thumbs up because if there's one thumb down, we'll stay some. Okay, thank you. I will take mine off too so you can understand me. I appreciate that. Welcome tonight to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. I'm Beth Hessel, the executive director. And it is really lovely and amazing to see each and every one of you this evening who are here. Those of you who are joining us virtually Welcome. At the Athenaeum, we celebrate the insatiable passion for learning. We nurture curiosity and seek to stoke enlivening and enlightening conversations that spark our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Our members are dreamers and doers. They are writers and artists and thinkers, creators and partakers, the practical minded and the light spirited. Our members are you and you. We're delighted to see each and every one of you this evening who is joining us in person or via Zoom, whether you are a longtime member or a new friend who has first stepped into our space this evening. We are grateful that you are sharing this evening with us. Our magnificent space, our programs, our circulating library and our research offerings are here for all of us. And we invite you to consider becoming a member of our community if you enjoy this evening's event and want to share in more. This evening, we celebrate the first in-person speaker series event in 18 months. And fingers crossed, this won't be the last one for a while. We are celebrating tonight. We are recognizing the Athenaeum Literary Award winner, Michelle Harper for her book, The Beauty in Breaking. During the past 18 months, we have all pivoted in so many ways. And in fact, some of us may feel like we have whiplash for the number of times that we have pivoted. Grief, confusion, fear, frustration, hope, that thing with feathers, and joy, yes, joy and healing are all emotions that we have experienced over the past 18 months. And in the midst of the cacophony of noise and voices and faces on TV and, and everything that has happened. We have heard some voices that center us, that stretch us and that guide us. And we're gonna hear those voices tonight. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the Athenaeum Literary Award. The Athenaeum Literary Award and its winner exemplifies for many the words we need to hear in this time. The award, which was established in 1950, recognizes books by local authors and or regional works which examine and reflect life in the greater Philadelphia area. The award comes with a cash prize and invitation to present a public lecture. A worthy book, whether academic or literary or popular, must be well-written, engaging, and accessible to a wide readership. Hence tonight's book. Winning books will reflect collect fresh points of view or shed new or unusual light on the greater Philadelphia area and invite lively dialogue about our world. We're grateful tonight to the children of Dr. Charles Wharton Stork who endowed the Charles Wharton Stork Memorial Lecture Program to support the Literary Award. Dr. Stork, who lived from 1881 to 1971, was a member of the Board of Directors from 1919, is that right, or 1979 to 1968, long time. Um, and we are, are grateful for his legacy in celebrating wonderful literature. Now tonight's winner, Michelle Harper, as I've said, is one of these voices that we want to hear. 
we hear her voice, we hear her message in her literary award-winning book, The Beauty in Breaking, which has um, such elegance and illuminating wonder in it. You may have heard her read an excerpt on receipt of the award at our virtual annual meeting in April. And you may be aware that Michelle Harper, not only uh, being an amazing writer, is also an emergency room physician uh, for more than a decade at numerous institutions in New York City and here in Philadelphia. And she brings her work as a physician to bear on her writing. And we are grateful to have her tonight. And we are thrilled. And it's been so much fun to get to know Michelle since giving her the award. I think the clue for the award committee is to give an award to anybody you want to have coffee with and become friends with. And we have done that here. And we're thrilled tonight to have in conversation with Michelle, uh, the one and only Lorraine Carey, who is Philadelphia's own award-winning author, playwright, and UPenn professor. Many of you likely remember the 219 conversation with Lorraine here at the Athenaeum about her memoir, Lady Sitting, My Year with Nana at the End of Her Century, which was recently commissioned as a play for art and theater and uh, was you know in 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 the run of it last in 2020 right before the pandemic hit isn't that right it was um no I'm sorry it was uh it was uh um sorry it was my general Tubman which was in there we go <laughs> lady sitting was just commissioned by art and theater but they also uh did a, a run a sold out run of of my general Tubman which was your first play right before the pandemic hit which was receiving wonderful reviews and many of us were probably hoping to see it and then the pandemic hit um, she is also the author of The Price of a Child, which was the first one book, one Philadelphia literary offering. Uh, so we're grateful to have the two of you in conversation tonight. Um, and uh, before I turn the, the mics over to you, we have handed out to everybody these cards. If you have questions, they're gonna be in conversation for 15, 20 minutes, it may be longer, who knows, because they're gonna have such fun talking together, but there will be a time for Q and A. We'll invite you to write any questions you have, send them to the outside aisles where one of our staff will pick up. If you are on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A and a staff person will write those questions down also. So all voices can be heard tonight and we will share those during the Q&A session. For those of you who are in person tonight, I hope that you will stop in the back for Head House Books and purchase several signed copies. Michelle is here to sign them of the book for yourself, for friends, for family, for members of your book club, um, so that everybody can read this book. And although we are unable to have a reception tonight, we hope you will stay for conversation with one another, knowing that we come together to raise our spirits and our hearts and minds in company, even if we cannot raise that glass of bubbly. So welcome tonight, and please join me in a warm welcome to Michelle Harper and Lorraine Carey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. And congratulations again. Thank you. This is great. I'm so, so delighted. What I love to do is to start, when you have a writer, it's great to start with, with a, a, a reading of the work, just a little bit of it. Some of you have already read this wonderful book. Some of you haven't. You've read the review or, or you're coming on faith. Good choice. Um, but I'd like you to start. Um, this is a this is a passage that that hit me for many reasons, and I think I think you'll hear it. It's absolutely um, it, it really gets us into the ER, and it gets us into medicine, uh, and it gets us into conflict and difficulty and what do you do at the moment please it turned out there was coffee in the break room i touched the side of the pot to find it was still hot i poured some into my cup and added cream and sugar to the tiny grainy brown brew thin and watery and likely at least five hours old in any other circumstances it would have been unpalatable but towards the end of a night shift it was ambrosia I inhaled caffeine and a hint of motor oil and took the first sacred sip. 
Now I was prepared for the patient I had no choice but to see. It was true that I didn't know him at all. So was it fair to judge? I had to admit that there might've been some extenuating circumstances to explain this patient's degeneracy. After all, I knew nothing more than what had come up in the notes. Maybe he had been abused as a child. It is not uncommon for boys who are abused to become abusers themselves. It is never a justification, of course, but it is an eventuality that deserves compassion. For all I knew, he had gotten therapy since the assault and was now a fundraiser for Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. It was a long shot, but it was possible. It still felt appropriate to make the patient wait, but I knew that there would eventually be other patients to see after him and it wouldn't be right to delay their care. I had squandered six minutes. There was still only one patient in the ER. I grabbed the male nurse who'd been assigned to the patient, Mike, and we headed over to his room. On the way, Mike grunted under his breath. I can't believe this guy is allowed to come back here. It's shameful. I half smiled at him in solidarity. The curtain to the room was ajar, revealing a wiry white man lying uncomfortably on the stretcher. His full head of dark hair made him look much younger than he was. His chart said 51. There was no sheet on the bed and no blanket. The man was tall and naked except for the thin white hospital gown embellished with navy blue geometric shapes. He seemed not to notice or care as he laid on the stretcher, writhing from side to side, his gown splayed open, revealing his bare backside. Mike stood at one side of the room and I stood next to him and leaned against the supply cart. I needed this bracing as well as the distance. Mike and I stared as the patient, as he flopped around like a fish on a hook. I sighed, making sure to convey that I was a distant authority figure. I said, Mr. Samuels from Dr. Harper, what brings you in today? Showing a little less enthusiasm than I might have had displayed when asking if he had a paperclip I could borrow. The pain, the pain, he moaned. It happened again. And what might that be, sir? The hernia, he whispered in, ag in, ag in anguish. I recall the triage note in the record. Hernia? You didn't come in for a hemorrhoid? Well, I don't, I don't know what it is. There's something swollen in my groin. It just started today and I can't take it. He was curled up in the fetal position, his knees bent to his chest. As he spoke, he buried his face in his hands. Okay, I said. Uh, let's take a look at this hernia. Lie on your back. He tried to relax his legs and attempted to pry them apart. Mike and I regarded him coolly. We didn't move as we waited for him to adjust and calm himself. When he was more still, I walked towards him. His fists were clenched around waves of pain and his toes twitched with the throbbing. I began to raise his gown and told him to straighten his legs. His arms flexed up and move towards me. I quickly dropped the edge of his gown and leaned back. Put your arms down, I commanded. Keep your arms down by your sides. Stay still, straighten your legs. His thighs were tense as I tapped the side of his right leg. Okay, open up. His legs stayed clamped. I didn't attempt to hide my annoyance. Sir, would you like to be examined or not? I continued, already knowing the answer. The only way I can do that is if you show me the area that is bothering you. I could sense Mike rolling his eyes, but I was too close to the patient to do anything more than grimace. The patient lifted his gown and spread his legs enough to reveal a large firm swelling extending from his right groin to his left scrotum, which was stretched to the size of an eggplant. The skin was so taut that it glistened. Still cautious but focused, I reached out to palpate the scrotum. I couldn't identify any anatomic landmark. I tried to follow what I imagined might be thick cord-like swelling down the inguinal canal, but all I could really discern was a balloon of exquisitely tender human flesh. What should I push back into place and where? What was intestine and what was testicle? Was there a perforation or dead bowel, an infection? I turned to Mike, who had already started to grab supplies. Our faces softened. softened. This was a surgical emergency, yes. The man was likely an awful human being, but his pain was real. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I asked you to read that because, 
because the pain was real. Yeah. And because those of us who are not doctors are not faced with someone who has hit another doctor mm -hmm. or groped another doctor or done um, assault. And, and then you have to take care of that person. Throughout this memoir, you talk about a health, a health system that you really describe more as a sickness system. Mm. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit, please, about if you had a change to make, what would it be to allow us um, Atal Gwande, I think I mentioned this in an email to you, recently wrote in the New Yorker a piece mm -hmm. about Costa Rica. And in it, he said Costa Rica had decided to focus all of the government's attention on community health. And he said, we in the United States focus on individual illness, and then we react to it. You've talked about the business mm -hmm. of medicine. This connect, this, this man and you, how does that business of medicine get in the way of what you were finally able to do? And this just a, a little more background on this patient. When the patient came into the ER, you know, it, it said his complaint was hemorrhoid, but then immediately what came up on the board was a violent patient alert. And this patient, there was a notice in the chart that he had assaulted a female physician who was trying to take care of him, doing a minor surgical procedure. And while she was taking care of him, he groped her breast. And then it was explained in the chart in this kind of perfunctory way. So she put down the instrument and a male physician came in and finished the procedure. And I was angry like a justifiable anger that somehow this man felt it was fine to assault a woman and that it was explained in such a walk-a-day way, commonplace. There was no indication that, of course, that the provider was okay, that the hospital had done anything to enact some kind of justice or accountability. And now here he was, and I had to take care of him. And I... I purposely wanted to talk about that instance because while my anger was justified, it also in that moment was not appropriate. He wasn't there being violent. He needed help. And as a healthcare provider, that's my job. So we took care of the patient and it wasn't lost on me as I discussed that that evening that I was the ER doctor, a woman taking care of him, saving his life. The two surgeons on call were also women. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't know if this man had made any changes in his life, but if he were to make change, if, if I were to be the provider and human I want to be, then I had to pause and give this man a chance. And perhaps in creating that space, he would also have the opportunity to be better and to do better. And, you know, I think. I had no idea this book would come out during the time it did, during a pandemic, during this potential, we'll see, like reckoning, reckoning with racism, um, structural bigotry of all kinds. And I think there are times when, you know, I, I, I was right to be concerned. You know, violence against women is not okay. But what about those times when we're not, when we make judgments about people and our, our understanding is flawed or even part of the problem? You know, like mm -hmm. there's an opportunity in there to stop and recognize the humanity in each other. And I remind myself of, of the same. And that's why I wanted to talk about this instance where I have to reflect also. I have to take that chance to learn and grow and use that moment of self-inquiry to do so. And connecting back, and feel free to interrupt me at any time because I tend to wander, I think. <laughs> but um, connecting back to 
healthcare and the business of medicine. No, I that's see. not wandering. That was, <laughs> that was a question. That was the question. Yeah. So you're talking about you yourself mm -hmm. in this instance, and now I'm asking you to connect back to the critique of the book. Yeah. I point to the book. I got the Kindle version. <laughs> yes, so that's the book. The critique you're of the two book. Two versions of the book. <laughs> Um, which has to do with how the business of medicine yeah. makes that kind of exquisite humanity and, and reflection more difficult. And that's just it. Right. I think that in this push to, unfortunately in our system, that we often say we just have to move the meat. That's mm -hmm. literally how people are referred to, move the meat. Hurry up and see this patient the next patient, we are evaluated on how quickly we see patients. We are penalized if we don't see them quicker. Um, there are penalties if you don't build to the maximum in most systems. And that is the focus. So this focus on stepping back and seeing the entirety of a person. I mean, in the ER, of course, like if someone's just been shot, we're not going to sit and talk about smoking cessation. We're not. Okay. So there's, there's a context, but addressing the acute issue, sure. But most of the time, there's more than that. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is the potential for addressing the context and seeing the entirety of humanity. So getting back to your question, we could do more of that if that was the focus. If public health was really central, there would be a lot more taking care of humans. There would be a lot more of, of public health. Mm -hmm. I have so many questions I want to ask you. So many questions. Um, when did you meet yoga and what does it do uh, for you? Yoga. Oh, one of the loves of my life. Okay, yoga. I met when I was starting over, um, finishing my residency program in New York City, and I found out I would be getting a divorce. Um, it was a surprise to me at the time and the person I was married to, and I have no hard feelings. He's a great guy. Wish him the best. <laughs> He's into uh, documentary film. And he said to me one day, you know, you're doing well on your path. You're about to graduate. You're going to be a physician. You have all these plans and I believe you're going to fulfill your plans and your goals. Thing is, if I'm with you, then I won't really be able to focus on what I need to do. And so then it was heartbreaking. It was devastating. Mm -hmm. the, the thought of starting over in this new city with a new job and now alone, because I didn't know anyone here at the time. Like his family was relocating. That would be the connection, but I didn't know anyone. But I got an attorney within the week, filed for divorce and said, you know, everything happens for a reason. So this is, this is just how this new chapter will be. And in order to heal my heart and to center and ground, I said, you know, my regular strategies of, of working out, going to the gym, eating healthy, they're all good, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And that's how I came to yoga. And I really found that the act, you know, it's not for everyone. We all have whatever our yoga is, whether it's painting or again, cooking or going for walks. But yoga for me is a way for me to come back to my body and my breath. And it literally is a moving meditation that opens up space for me physically. But then I feel there's the foundational work that allows that space spiritually. Mm -hmm. So I started yes. it like a, a, over a decade ago now, and it's, it's never left. It's just it's part of my life. Great. When I was reading this book, I was thinking that Elizabeth Gilbert had a divorce and she did eat and she had to go to Italy and eat good things and do eat, pray, love. And this was like, instead of going to Italy and finding great food, this was, hmm, I have a divorce. Let me go and take care of people in underserved neighborhoods. Yeah. Hmm. Let me do that. Right. And then there was the prey and then there was the love. So it's sort of cure prey love, which yeah, yeah. is a is a different way of going. Oh, you know, if I had time to go to Italy, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be nice. I yeah. hope to make it. <laughs> yeah. That'd be nice. That'd be nice.
Um, but she, you know, she didn't save <laughs> a lot of lives in, in New Hampshire. So did you, when you wrote this book, was it always a memoir or, or was it gonna be something else? Sometimes you have a repertorial mm -hmm. book or you have a different book. What, you know, now this became a memoir. So I didn't know what I was doing because I'm, I'm sure it comes as a shock to exactly know on that I was a psychology major in undergrad and, and then on the medical trajectory also, but not, not a literary background. So there were stories that stayed with me throughout mm -hmm. residency. And because those stories stayed with me, um, I, I just felt at some point I would write a book. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how. I thought, okay, I'm going to have to find my words again because part of this medical track is forgetting how to speak, not knowing how to write. And not, I mean, like literally just the act of writing, it, it all goes away. Um, so I thought I would enroll in a class and that, that way I'd work on my writing and then book. Of course, with my shifts, I couldn't make a class. So I hired um, someone who, who did teach classes. And as I wrote essays, she would give me writing prompts. I thought, wait a second. I actually want to write a book. I have these ideas. So my writing prompts can be my ideas for the book. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it came into being. And I will tell you, initially, it focused more on the, on the patients. Mm -hmm. Because like anybody who writes a memoir, I'm a very private person, which is how it goes. <laughs> and once I got the book deal, then my editor at the publisher said, you know, there's, there's some good stuff in here about your divorce or past relationship. And family stuff is good, but somehow you're going to have to figure out how to put more of you in it, which was excruciating for me. He was right. It was the right thing to do. And I, I learned so much from that process and it was very cathartic and the book is better, certainly. So that was kind of the metamorphosis of, of the writing process for me. And it took you how long? If I had, and one day I'm going to look back at the emails from start to finish, maybe around five years, five or six, I want to say, because there was the writing and then it took me over a year to get an agent because I didn't know what to do. I, I hired a literary consultant turned friend and <laughs> <laughs> who gave me advice um, and helped me navigate this path over a year to get an agent, just rejection after rejection after rejection. And then once I had an agent, within 30 days, it was sold at auction and then editing for a year with the editor and then waiting like eight months for the release date. So it was a long process. Oh, no, that's regular. That's sort of regular. <laughs> <laughs> for me, as an ER doctor, it's long. I'm like, you know, in a shift, I can save at least a couple lives. This book thing, why is it taking yeah, so long? Yeah. <laughs> um, my sister, my sister is an airline pilot who's mm -hmm. just written a book about Bessie Coleman. And she said to me, I don't like this business model. I don't like this whole book business model because she also likes to, you know, drive fast and go high. Right. <laughs> right, right. Um, where are we? Do we have a lot of questions? Or if you don't, if you say, look, I came here, you asked me. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. We have we have more. That's like my yes, we, shirt is that, like coming. There's one in front of you here at the in the front. This microphone situation. We'll start here is one. Uh, we'll have a couple of questions and then you can ask her another question while we get more because I see people writing. Mm -hmm. Um, this one is a comment, not a question. So maybe if you want to reflect on the comment. Uh, ER doctors are different than many specialists because you're not able to build up a relationship mm -hmm. over um, with the, with the, uh, the, uh, the patient is very temporary. And, and, yeah. and what is that? I guess, what is it like? How does it? Yeah. It's true. Now, that being said, um, no matter where I work, there's always a certain percentage of people who we see regularly. Wow. Um, sometimes because they have a chronic illness that unfortunately is bringing them back to the ER. Mm -hmm. But other times it's, it's just a comfortable place 
for them to come. So, so they do. I mean, they're, they're patients where we get to know their families. I, you know, I remember one from New York City who would come in all the time. Um, he had asthma. So for a breathing treatment, I mean, he had a nebulizer at home, but he would just come in for a breathing treatment and he would talk. And if his family couldn't find him, they would call the ER asking if he was there that evening. So, so often we do get relationships with patients, but you're right. On the other hand, it's a, a discrete interaction, can be very intense for that shift. You know, if we're seeing someone with mental health crisis and they're suicidal, um, and, I, and I have to check on that patient over and over again, I can come to learn a lot about them. But you're right, it is just in that moment. And I would say, given the intensity of the work that we do, it would be, I, I think it, may make it sustainable because if there was that much crisis and lingering connections which with all of those humans it it may be even harder than it is so in some ways i think it works for the nature of, of the job have you have you thought of, i'll just that's a great question have mm -hmm. um have you thought about other specialties no, I mean, because we become board certified. So, and because everything is so specialized in this country, if I was mm -hmm. gonna do something, I mean, I could do urgent care. Um, people have asked me if I wanted to join them and do, you know, Botox and stuff. Mm. Like, you know, <laughs> I've not done that. I'm not, I, listen, people should do what they want. I just can't, you know, it's not, it's not what I'm here to do. Um, but if I was gonna do something else, for example, um, I don't know, ENT or a different specialty, you have to get board certified. So I'd have to go through training all over again. So it's not feasible, but I happen to, it works for me to be there with people in their time of crisis. I like that. Um, I see the need for it. I want to be the person that does it. Mm -hmm. And you know, for those of you who haven't read my book, I, I know that I was called to that because I grew up in an abusive household with the father who was a batterer. So I had to overcome personally a lot of trauma. And I know what it's like to be there. And in the moment, all you have is a snapshot in time, and making a decision, um, will we be safe now? Is there likely real danger or will this blow over? I know what it feels like to be that person. I know what it feels like to heal from that. And my feeling is that in doing that healing, we do have the opportunity then to be a support system for others moving forward. So that's why even now, as I'm getting busier with the literary, some people have said, why don't you just do urgent care? It'll free up time, depending on the urgent care and bonuses, you can even make more money. But I don't wanna leave the ER, but there's still work for me to do there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you tell us about the title of your book and the meaning behind it or meanings. Yeah. So the, the beauty in breaking, and I'm really sorry I'm about to butcher this name no matter how much I try, but it's, um, I call it that as I, as I reflect upon the Japanese, the ancient Japanese art of Kinsokuroi. Um, and in Kinsokuroi, if if pottery is broken, if something happens to it, falls, it's repaired with an amalgam of precious metal, where they're not that platinum, silver, yellow gold, because the thinking is that we don't wanna hide or ignore what it's been through. We don't wanna disregard it either. And that in that process of repair, the vessel is considered that much more beautiful because it's been through it, it's been through the mutability of life. We honor that process. Um, and I feel the true, the same is true of humans. And I don't romanticize trauma, that's not it. It's, it's that life will always present challenges. But then the question is what we do with that. And through the rebuilding, we can be more resilient and we can be, um, become more, be deepened in our, by our experiences that I consider to be beautiful. So we have several questions curious about 
how the medical profession might be reformed. Um, wondering about the demands placed on you with the hours and length of your shifts. Is it reasonable? Is it counterproductive? We'll start with that one. Ooh. There's, there's, how should I put this? There's many opportunities for improvement in the medical field. <laughs> many opportunities. Um, it's, it's interesting, I, I would say, that in, in a field, in a profession, and I'm sure there are different healthcare providers among us, that is charged with helping human beings. There is so little regard for the provider themselves. And it is, I would say, impossible to exact um, appropriate medical care from someone who is demeaned and diminished in their daily lives. And I think that unfortunately, healthcare is going in the very wrong direction. So, you know, before the pandemic, every journal I would get, we get electronic journals, paper journals, and everyone for emergency medicine, there were pieces on how to get out of medicine. I'm not joking you, like everyone, how to get out of medicine. That is what people are really angling to do. And now with the pressures of the pandemic and being in positions where we've put our lives on the line and people, people have lost their lives, lost family members, put an extra time at work to be of service and then still have had their pay cut, um, been fired, furloughed. We're at a time in emergency medicine where it's very difficult to get work now, not because patients don't need people, but because positions have been cut because people who own the groups want to maximize profits. So that's what's happening in medicine now. Um, so, you know, one thing we can do is, is to have a system that's really based on, on healthcare. I mean, I think that if we have, and all the solutions people say, you know, diversity in healthcare um, within providers, access to healthcare, everyone deserves access to healthcare. Like if, if the point of healthcare was to serve the public, then like every other rich nation, everyone would have health. Like literally, when I say, I mean literally every other rich nation, everyone would have healthcare. Um, there would be equity in, in hiring, promotions, pay. Um, we'd have time with patients. Hospitals would be adequately staffed, not staffed to get maximal profit, but staffed to have maximal outcomes. So there's a lot, the good news is, there is a lot we can do. <laughs> and now we just have to, um, to do it, which is a huge reason why I wrote this book and I have these events and do speaking and I wanna do more writing because there are people in healthcare who do care. We also don't, you know, people are tired. I mean, even the, the really good people who wanna make change, they're so burnt out but it's not everyone in healthcare and we don't have the numbers, which is why in many ways for this work that I'm doing, I intentionally left the House of Medicine to do this aspect of my work because it's gonna be a collaborative effort between providers and the community to make these changes. You said, you've talked about people leaving medicine and mm -hmm. I've heard lots of People, I know many people in uh, in nursing and mm -hmm. various kinds of care who say after this last year I can't yeah. anymore. I'm I was too afraid. I am too tired, etc. It's also true that I went to my granddaughter's graduation from nursing school in May, and it's also true that the that there are people every year. Mm -hmm. who are graduating just yeah. thousands and thousands of new people who, who are going in, ready, sort of ready to run themselves over the cliff or <laughs> ready to go in the ditch, ready to, to yeah. do the hours, ready to try. Um, where, where are, in, in medicine, do you know where are the areas, maybe someone in the group knows, mm -hmm. where are the areas of reflection of people who are watching those groups come in and say, 
wait a minute. So you don't have um, you don't have unions per se, right. but some professional organizations that notice trends or or begin to quietly work towards some kind. I mean, they're changed. There are groups all over doing right. it, but. But where is it? I, my, my husband grew up in Iowa. There were farms everywhere. Mm -hmm. They talked about getting the farmers together. It was really hard because yeah. farmers don't get together. Like that's a problem. They have their own farm. Yeah. Uh, doctors, nur nurses, the, the different groups work differently. Yeah, there's, I have not seen much collaboration. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I mean, little, groups of people might get together and try and work towards an initiative, but there's very little coordination. Um, there have been the Black Doctors organizations that came up specifically right. around the COVID, which was fascinating. Yes. But that's for... That's that goes at a specific problem as right. opposed to... In certain areas, in certain at certain areas. times. So... I mean, I, I've noticed the energy, you know, the energy of 2020 with people galvanizing, you know, be, feeling galvanized for change. So we'll see. There was a momentum that was building. And now we just have to see if it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. But not yet. We're, we're still, from what I've seen from people I've spoken to um, when I do, do these events with doctors groups, whether it's surgeons or medical students still at the very beginning stages. We have a couple of questions related to medical school. Yeah. Um, and then some wonderful other questions too, but I thought I'd, I'd look at these one. Um, one of our, our guests tonight was a, a student rep on the SUNY Stony Brook, SUNY Stony Brook is the executive committee of the, of the Senate when the medical school was being established in the early 1970s. And there was a move there for the medical school to be independent of the full faculty senate. And mm. this individual as a student rep was really concerned about that because they believe that medical ethics is the, the concern of the full body and not just the medical school. Right. And, and wondering, they're wondering if you, think that the decision to let the, the medical school be separate when they deal with issues like medical ethics was, is a good decision or if it really should be a broader conversation. I mean, so I will say this just broadly speaking, because I don't know the, the specifics of that decision or circumstance or what was going into it. Um, in general, I value the, the discussions that happen in-house when we're speaking about ethics, but I don't think it can happen alone. I mean, we have Unfortunately, in medicine, long traditions of history, history and really what are traditions of disparities in medicine, um, a lack of inclusion, um, equity, diversity. So the idea to me that the decisions and these discussions would only happen mm -hmm. within those halls, I think is very problematic, which is why I think it's important to speak about these topics. And in, um, in-house, yes, certainly but then in a, in a larger forum, because we need, clearly we need other input. And these are matters that affect everyone. It doesn't just affect the students or the physician, teachers, attending faculty. It affects the whole community. So we all need to be involved in that. And another person wants to know if, 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 you, could, if you could run a medical school, are there programs that, are there, are there topics um, or courses that you wish medical schools would cover that may not be standard topics to cover? I mean, ideally I feel that part of medical education where I feel like all of it should be infused with certainly critical thinking. There's a certain um, core curriculum we need for disease process, um, pathology, et cetera. Sure, but all of it should be infused with this perspective of public health, with the context of humans that we're treating, with this understanding that, for example, 
given our healthcare system. If you're writing someone for a medication they can't afford, you're not going to treat them. If they can't get the medication, nothing will be addressed. So having these contextual, contextualized conversation is important to treat the person. And then I would hope that by having those discussions and infused in that, into the energy of that education, I think it would foster this sense of being rooted in the community, feeling a sense of responsibility of the community, and then wanting to make these changes in medicine so that we have better outcomes, so that it does focus on public health. Because sure, it happens one-on-one -on -one with the patient, of course, in addressing their specific needs, but then beyond that, addressing the needs of the community, addressing the needs of everyone in this country, which gets us into the work we have to do outside of that, like running for office and voting and engaging in the political process because everything is political. The decisions we make actively and those we just give tacit agreement to. I, I wanted to come back to your early time going into medicine because we, you, um, everybody talks about we, we need to have more diversity, we need to have more yeah. women, more people of color, et cetera. Um, you, you write in the book about uh, difficulties and determination, both. What stops? What stops young black women from getting it? I know it's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, happen. but I want to ask right. the question open, right? right? Why people say, oh, we don't have because, because, because. But it's a it's a it's a ridiculously big question and it shouldn't right. be. Right. But it is. But it is. You know, when we think about groups of people that are underrepresented in medicine. You know, and, and I'll, I just have to give the story. Yeah, give a story. I have to give, mm -hmm. there'll be different stories. But the hallway story, for example, mm -hmm. and when we walk through certainly any hospital, and I'm sure it happens in, uh, I'm assuming it happens in other businesses, law firms, what have you. There's always a hallway and there's always a hallway that shows the leadership over time. And if you've been to hospitals <laughs> like I have, at various places in the country. And it doesn't matter if we're in Trenton or, oh, sorry, that's how you know I'm not from Trenton, Trenton <laughs> or, or South Bronx or wherever. Um, it typically is different portraits of old white men who do their gender in such a way that we understand is like, you know, heteronormative. And that's it. And no matter where you are in the country, that's not representative. I mean, I tend to work in, in major cities where certainly not everyone, the patient population is not all white. Um, no matter where you are, half the population is women. That wall will not be representative anywhere. But what it does do is it shows quite literally who the hospital feels are their stakeholders, who the hospital feels are the people who should be making decisions, who are making decisions the people they feel are most appropriate and invested. And it sends that message quite powerfully. Um, so to get to the place where we have equity, that would need to change so that there's access for other people. There's no shortage of people. You know, I give the example, this one I don't give when I was very, very little. Um, third grade, doing very well in school, and I had to. Not only did I enjoy it, but I felt, you know, this was my way out, this was my way forward. I would be autonomous. I wouldn't feel codependent like my mother. I could be free in my life. And when I was about to go to fourth grade, my third grade teacher pulled my mother aside and said, this school's been great for her, but for the next section, when she's gonna go to the next campus, they don't have the resources she needs. You all need to apply to, and she gave the name of a prestigious school in Washington, DC. I applied, I did well, that's where I started. And 
I didn't know the pressures that would come along with it, not the work, like I was used to that, but I was one of two at that time for fourth year class, one of two black girls. I didn't realize what pressures or constraints might be there at that time because I was coming from diverse primary education. And I was growing up in a part of DC that was predominantly black and affluent. When I got there, all of a sudden, when I was doing my quizzes and tests, there were no more stars and stickers and awards. And I didn't understand because I felt I was getting the material. It didn't seem to correlate. And I was heartbroken because what they didn't know is like, I needed this I, I, in my estimation, in my fourth grade mind. So my mother spoke to them about it. She raised her concerns that maybe I was being tracked. And they said, well, we'll bring in an independent test taker. We know she already did well in the entrance, but just to see if there's really an issue, we'll bring an independent test taker to find out. When my mom was brought back in for the test results, um, that first the principal said, the proctor didn't even understand how she took the test because in the background, there was so much noise. There were kids screaming in the hallway, yelling, laughing. It was after school. They hadn't been picked up yet. Backpacks being thrown against the hall. But Michelle never looked up. And in truth, I don't remember the noise. Like I had to learn how to survive in chaos. I was there for a test. I took the test. That's what I remembered. That's what I did. And then she went on to say that I did extremely well on the test. So she agreed. Didn't make sense. It didn't match the grades on the paper. And so magically after that, because I spoke out, because my mother had them name it, the grades matched my effort, what I had earned. So like these are, and I use that story specifically because that's when I was in fourth grade. Like it, it can happen at right. any point along the way where people can be derailed. And does, yeah, and does, and happens at several points along yeah. the way. Yeah, and it happens in several, yes. several yes. points. Yes, yes. When you were talking, yeah. uh, I remembered that when our neighbor suggested that I apply to St. Paul's School, mm -hmm. uh, you needed to have your school grades, and, and and the school wrote to me, and I filled out the application, and and the school called my my parents and said, we don't have her the things from school we we need to get the grade like we we were already past the deadline we told the school and and we went to them and they just they didn't take it seriously mm -hmm. they said she's not going to go you know she's not going to go like what are you what are you talking about so we 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 uh we insisted mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know, and I um... suppose they hadn't said anything. Right. Suppose the school had just assumed that the grades were bad and that they did. Suppose right. they were too busy. Suppose somebody didn't pick up. Suppose. Yeah. Right. You know, and that's why I um, I know there are many people who've been through similar experiences, and you know, I speak about that or I speak about my childhood to to remove that stigma. Mm -hmm. And it's very freeing because there's certain certain things in our lives that are a responsibility than others that aren't. So we shouldn't have to carry around that burden, um, which was another mission of the book, just mission of my work, mm -hmm. that, that freeing process, that, that liberatory work that is integral to healing. And the, the, yeah. the larger structural issue. Absolutely. The larger structural issue is right. that you should not have had to go so Agreed. far in fourth grade. The Agreed. larger structural issue is that I should not have had to go to St. Yeah. Paul's school in order to get a proper education. Right. No, I agree. Yeah. And that's why, yeah. 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 to me, the conversations, have, for me, have to happen together. Yeah. And that work of addressing the structural has to happen with anything else that I do. You got another question, don't you? I do. We have yeah. some wonderful questions. Um, would you speak a little bit about your relationship with your father mm -hmm. and how that 
has influenced both your career choices and your approach to patient care? I am sure, you know, when I was giving that example of um, how I could focus in school or uh, on tests, what was that my? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how I could focus on tests, um, why I was drawn to the ER to begin with. And that's it. I, I am 100% aware my father's a physician. And sometimes people ask, do you think you're a physician because he's a physician? Definitely not. I mean, I was well aware he was a physician, but it's everything else that I experienced that brought me to emergency medicine and, and, and medicine in general. Um, so there's that part. And the patient care, I know it influences again, in the ER, it's hard, but when I can, I know it in, influences me wanting to pause and be receptive to what's happening beneath the surface and, and screening for danger, whatever that is, like physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, an example is, you know, we're taught in medical school, always screen for abuse, intimate partner violence, or if it's um, an elderly, uh, violent against elderly people or anyone, somebody who has physical or cognitive impairments. So we're taught that people often skip that part, you know, to mm -hmm. save time. Um, I don't, you know, and I, I was taking in, in the past, I was taking care of a, um, a teenager. Her mother brought her in. And the mother said, I know we're not supposed to be in the ER. She's anxious, she's not doing well in school. And I know there's really not much you can do about it in the ER. It's just that the therapist, the appointment will be a couple of weeks and I don't know what else to do. I don't know who to talk to. We just gave it a shot. And so I asked, um, I asked the mother, you know, I said to her, I always ask the parent to step out because certain questions I need to speak to the child alone with just to be safe just to make sure everyone's okay she agreed and she did step out of the room and then when I spoke to the girl she said you know actually I think that I'm really depressed and anxious and it all started years ago when and she relayed how she was sexually abused by a family member and that family member is now out of the country she's not around that person anymore she feels physically safe from them, but she's been left with the scars of that trauma. And so I did explain to her that, you know, certain conversations are no longer confidential. And as we're talking about the sexual abuse, you know, of, of her, a child, I do need to speak to her mother about that. Um, we may need to have other conversations to make sure that she's safe. And she said to me, thank you. And please do talk to my mother because told my mother, she said she didn't believe me. She said she never wanted me to bring it up again. I know that's why I'm not okay, but maybe if you tell her, she'll finally believe me. It's like these are the, I've been sensitized to that kind of work because of my life and knowing that there can be so much going on behind the scenes that you may not feel comfortable bringing up. And if you're you may not even be in this space. Like for example, if you're a child, it may not even occur to you that you, you can, or you may not have the language. So it's influenced just how I am in the world. I have to say, um, it's fun to watch the Marvel movies or the other about the super, because you learn about the reality, who these people mm -hmm. are and how they became the super, yeah heroes that they are and the, 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 the wounds that they carry that influence their work. And like your editor is asking you to put more of yourself in yeah. your book. <laughs> it, it made it a richer book because we see not just someone who is a superhero emergency room doctor saving the day, but we see how you bring your full self um, into it. And that makes it a, a really powerful and Rich Reed, and I, I want to thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And just to close the loop on that, there was in that interaction a, a really happy ending because 
when mm -hmm. mom did come back and we had the discussion, she really broke down mm -hmm. um, and apologized to her daughter. It was what she wanted to hear, acknowledge, apologize. Mm -hmm. And mom said she could never face it because she was abused when she was young and she just couldn't mm -hmm. face her abuse or anybody else's. And they did both go into therapy um, and they seem to have a good connection. And so it, I don't have follow-up in the case, but it seemed that there really was a, a, a positive outcome for this family. Did you have a final question, Lorraine? I did. I did. Now, now I got into this. <laughs> <laughs> Now the the the, 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 the movies and is in my wow. um, I would I this wasn't my final, but it was but okay. What's the best thing that happened to you in the ER in the last few weeks? Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna say it's a little bit hard because in the, in the last couple of weeks I've more been doing <laughs> Speaking of ants, <laughs> okay. so I haven't had that many ships. We can go back. We can, this it's is just like doing your bank account, right? When it says, you know, past week, past oh, 30 days, past 60 one. days. I mean, I will. Give anything that's joyous that comes to your mind. Okay. Because a lot of what we've been talking about. This, so, so this, I mean, this positive, story you just gave us. Yeah. Is a, is a beautiful ending. Right. And a lot of what you managed to do in the book is walk between, as you said, um, it's not true that suffering and trauma always makes one wiser, right? right? right. It's, and it's, not, it's also not true that, um, that the only reason you're good is because right because you've been like right. Japanese sculpture and broke, you know, right? So give us some of the joy of it. Can I? Yeah, I know give this a story. Is, Could be some in the book. I know this is cheating a little bit, but this is, this is top of mind. ER doctors cheat. <laughs> they do. This is just top of mind because I was thinking about it as I was walking over. Mm -hmm. And I love being in the ER. And this literary path and, and writing this book and getting to hang out with you and people across the country and even the world has been really mm -hmm. rewarding um, and having these conversations with people in medicine and also mostly outside of medicine, which I value as we discussed. And recently I got to speak with the first year medical students um, at UC San Diego. And then the College of Surgeons asked me, I was shocked, surgeons usually do not. <laughs> um, but they asked me to speak to them, which is what I was doing earlier today. And they specifically wanted to talk about disparities in healthcare. And you know, according to their new mission, they want to address it. And Honestly, these collaborations are giving me so much hope that we're hearing from people from different parts of the nation, different parts of medicine, even some parts of medicine that traditionally have been so entrenched. But there are little cracks. There are openings mm -hmm. now. So, I mean, I, I hope it continues. I hope we can build on this. But these, these, these recent days, weeks are, are quite rejuvenating. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad the book deserves it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to Michelle Harper. This has been a fabulous, fabulous conversation, a wonderful evening. Thank you to everyone for your questions. If we didn't get every single one of them, um, as you can tell, there was so much to talk about. 
I invite you, I'm going to usher Michelle to the back of the room to sign books. If you brought one with you, if you want to buy one or five or six. Can I add one thing? Yes. Here. We talked on the telephone about whether to have a traditional Athenaeum reception and whether with COVID restrictions and you could or you couldn't, et cetera. And I met someone at my mother's senior residence who said to me, I saw this was gonna happen. This is great. I love the Athenaeum and they're the best reception. Oh. <laughs> so, but she couldn't come tonight. So we so. promise you as soon as it is safe, we will have receptions again. If you have not experienced one, get on our mailing list. So you find out when they will be, they are, um, deviled eggs and lemon bars and cheap wine and, and cheap wine. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. And wonderful company. That's the best part. So we invite you to stay to buy a book or two or four or a dozen to get them signed by Michelle to share in oh, conversation geez. with one another with our masks on. But you don't have to rush out the door. We're so glad you're here. And thank you again, Michelle and Lorraine, for a wonderful, wonderful evening.